Okay, 4 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Life After Statehood with uh, our informed citizen, Ray uh, Tsuchiyama. Thank you for coming down again, Ray. Thank you very much. Since this uh, topic is so important, I well, decided to... let me say to, what the topic uh, is. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry okay. uh, taking your so time. So casting about for something really <laughs> interesting because Ray and I get so excited and interested, especially Ray, about some of these topics in life and analysis of Hawaii life after statehood and before. <clears throat> this time we struck on religion as a phenomenon in Hawaii, historically, socially, reaching every corner of, of the development of our state and still today. And Ray immediately wrote, how many was it? A thousand <laughs> a words. A couple of he sent me a little email with a thousand <laughs> a words it's about a his, his reaction right. to the subject. So at that point, I realized this was a really, really good <laughs> subject. So Ray, let me ask you, in the, in the old day, in the day uh, that we spoke about in our last meeting, in the day, uh, the elegant time of King Kalakaua. Right. Um, what was the religion here in Hawaii? Uh, it was heavily Protestant. Uh, Protestant because of missionaries who came here in the 1820s and, and founded a series of churches. Uh, they began to really interact with uh, Hawaiian language, codifying, uh, uh, creating an alphabet, translating the Bible into Olelo Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, right there. Some of the words like Cristo, uh, uh, K-R, uh, still survive. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. like uh, uh, violating the Hawaiian uh, grammar, but because of, uh, because of you know, Christian words, yeah. uh, they're around. So, so there were a huge cultural, religious, uh, and educational um, uh, catalyst to Hawaiian society uh, uh, throughout uh, the 19th century. And he was Protestant. King Kalakaua? Yeah. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. Yeah. So here you had, within a 50-year period in, in the development of the, of, the, of the sovereignty of the kingdom, um, you had people turning from the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian religion, right. what I'd like you to tell me about that, um, to Protestantism. So my question is, hmm, what happened and why? Well, uh, you've got to go back to uh, just around the time before the missionaries came, Queen Kahamanu really was a leader in the destruction of the older religions, kapu, uh, you know, the, um, all kinds of regulations that codified uh, how uh, the lower classes in Hawaiian society, women and, and, and what they could eat and not eat, all kinds of things. And uh, she really was a leader in, in, in kind of overthrowing the old uh, uh, gods and adopting Christianity. Mental were the missionaries in that move? Uh, they were of uh, tremendous uh, impact uh, to Hawaiian society. And of course, this led to the adoption of Western dress, uh, you know, speaking English, uh, and of course, adopting all kinds of things, uh, using nails, um, houses, um, all kinds of things came in. And of course, new foods uh, began to be uh, planted in Hawaii. And of course, the transformation of the economy, mm. sandalwood, sugar, and so forth. You know, people talk about the 19th century, you know, the old days, a couple hundred years ago and all that, as, as slow moving. But in, here in Hawaii, that wasn't true. There was something happening every minute. There were so many transformations going on. I don't think we realize today that relative to the rest of the world in that time, there was a lot of action here, a lot of international action, a lot of social action, a lot of changing. That's correct. And uh, when King Kalakaua um, was elected as king, he departed for a worldwide tour. And he visited uh, the, the emperor of Japan. He went to Thailand. He went to <coughs> India, the Middle East, to Europe. He saw, uh, he, he met Buddhists, uh, uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, uh, other Christians. He, he had a wealth of knowledge, uh, insights to the world. In fact, uh, the, the first attorney general uh, of the Kingdom of Hawaii was Paul Newman. He was Jewish from Prussia, <laughs> for, uh, uh, you know, but he was a loyal subject of the kingdom, yeah. as many, many people who, were, well. uh, who, who came from Europe and the United States. So it, it was uh, an inclus inclusive society and accepted other religions than Christianity. And of course, by the time King Kalakau and Queen Kalani uh, uh, were in power, there were thousands of Chinese who were here already, bringing Taoism and Buddhism. Uh, Japanese began to come in also, bringing Buddhism and Shintoism. So again, there were other religions uh, in, in the streets. Uh, yeah, let's talk uh, about that. So a bunch of guys realized that sugar beets out of the South is not enough. They can make a lot of money doing cane here. So they changed everything around 1850 and thereafter. And now we, we need immigrants, we need labor. So we invite labor, we, we, we make all kinds of arrangements to get labor out of Asia. 
uh, and to a limited degree Portugal or the Canary right, Islands right, as right. the case. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they bring their own culture, they bring their own race, if you call it that, and they bring their own religion. This right. changes everything. How did this change what we would otherwise find because all these immigrants are coming and they're bringing their own religion with them? Well, by the 1880s and 90s, there were Buddhist priests, missionaries that accompanied, uh, you know, uh, plantation okay, laborers. With, with oh, the yeah, immigrants. they were came, coming in. Always uh, take your priests <laughs> with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Japanese government wanted to, of course, promote Japanese uh, religion and culture uh, abroad, and uh, and also uh, the, uh, the priests, like any other priests, acted also as what we would see as psychological counselors. I mean, in families, there were fights, you know, and there were sure. drunken brawls by men. Uh, they sure. had to control them. And, Life was and, tough. Yeah, and, and priests would come and counsel people. So the same type of counseling we see today of crystal meth or, you know, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of abuse within families, they were treating and trying to uh, deal with uh, those issues. How so about the Chinese? Uh, they uh, were mostly men, as you know, in early part, and they intermarried a lot with uh, with Hawaiian women and created a whole new, uh, you know, uh, niche within uh, Hawaiian society. What was their religion? Uh, well, they brought uh, Buddhism, Taoism uh, to to religions there. Uh, many have converted to Christianity, mm -hmm. and so the acceleration of conversions we'll see very early on by by people from Asia. You know, it strikes me that these religions that that were imported with the immigrants and all that. They were bound to 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 decline over time. In, in other words, you didn't find a Hawaiian citizen that would that would um, convert to um, to Taoism or convert to Buddhism. They wouldn't right. do that. It was only for the people who brought them, and those people were assimilating elsewhere. The result was those religions had a decline. Right. When well, did that, when did that well, happen? You're, you're correct that uh, when Buddhist missionaries came, they weren't really uh, active proselytization agents, right. uh, number one. Not, not part of the yeah, deal. They, yeah. they were not. And, and remember, some people brought their own uh, um, uh, form of Christianity. Uh, Christianity came to the Philippines in the 16th century under Magellan, when you think about it. Yeah. So they were already 200 years before Captain Cook, already dealing with, with Christianity. Uh, but you're correct that uh, many, many uh, people, especially children of immigrants, began to uh, uh, be uh, converted and go to Christian schools, and they saw Christianity as a way of becoming 100% uh, Americans. Yeah, so this is an interesting part of the whole plantation process and the assimilation process, um, and they wanted to become American. Right. And the, the, the easy way to do that, I mean, one, one is I suppose you could change your political party, <laughs> and some of them did, um, but the other, is, uh, the other is that you change your religion, and now you right. could look more like the person you wanted to assimilate to, and and, and improve your prospects, uh, both individually, for family, for the community. And over a period of time, uh, all those Japanese Buddhists, I shouldn't say all, but a great percentage, huge percentage of them, became Christian. When, when did that happen? Well, especially during the 20s and 30s. Yeah. And um, a, a good example is uh, son of Nainome. His mother from Maui was unfortunately an orphan, but she was adopted into a Methodist minister's family, became a very raging <laughs> Methodist, and of course, uh, Dad Inoue uh, was raised in a Methodist world. And of course, when he became uh, a teenager, he started going to the YMCA, yeah. which was a bastion of very liberal, secular ideas, uh, democracy, sports, and, and you could read Life magazine and look and, and discuss time. And it was, it was uh, I mean, the, the difference between the mother and the son was like worlds apart when yes. you think about it. And, and you can see already by the 30s in Pearl Harbor, uh, if you knew all about uh, proms and, and uh, Christmas and, and, and uh, you know, and, and all about uh, oh, uh, sports, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, could, uh, you could do very well in the U.S. Army. I mean, you were at the same level or even better uh, than yeah. people coming out of Arkansas and Montana. Yeah. So, so it, was, it was a very huge uh, uh, change uh, that occurred at that time. So what about, what about that generational shift now? You know, you have the parents and they're clearly Buddhist uh, and, the, and the kids are, they go to the YMCA and there's not much religion there. It's kind of ersatz religion because it isn't really happening. Um, and uh, they're trying to assimilate and they, <clears throat> they're, they're turning uh, Christian. Uh, how do the parents feel about that? Did, did that stress the family? Um, how, how do you deal in a family in those generations with one generation, one religion, next generation, predictably another religion? Well, it depends on the family, but in most 
in my own family, I have uh, my parents who were buried in Buddhist rites. I have an uncle who were, uh, who's also Buddhist. I have another uncle who was uh, buried under a Christian, uh, a very Protestant uh, rites. I have cousins who are uh, evangelical Baptists and, 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 and uh, beyond. I, I am a Buddhist also, but my wife is Episcopalian. And I also go to a Shinto shrine during New Year's. So, uh, it depends on the family, but I think even within families, you just don't talk about those things. That in uh, uh, you go with the flow of where your uh, friends uh, uh, are uh, are going to. This I think. is so interesting. And, and, and neighborhoods, <laughs> yeah. because when I was a child, I attended Kali Union a Church, a very Protestant, very. But if you see what Kali Union is today, and 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 30, 40 years ago, it used to be very Japanese. Yeah. And now. Is very Filipino, I would yeah, think, yeah, or, uh, yeah. and, and or immigrants. So you can see the whole kind of uh, uh, um, uh, you know historical change uh, within society by looking at the demographics of a church. Yeah, but nobody criticized the other guy for you know wearing a different religion. It was okay. It was part of the assimilation process. Am I right? I would say uh, yes. I would say that um, you know if you go to punch bowl. Uh, I had um, friends from the mainland, uh, and they were well aware of Arlington National Mer uh, Cemetery uh, on the mainland. When they went to Punch Bowl and looked at the chapel, and, we, and there's a small uh, prayer chapel um, in, in the larger uh, uh, area of Punch Bowl, they saw three symbols the Christian cross, Star of David, and a Buddhist mandala. <laughs> And that the trilogy. Is, <laughs> well, when you think about it, to see that in Arlington National Cemetery, that is quite a leap. That's yeah, quite yeah, a leap. Yeah. But in many, many uh, 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 of the grave sites, including my parents, there's a Buddhist mandala. Uh, yeah. There could be a Star David or, or nothing at all. So, so uh, nobody really cares uh, uh, what you have, but you respect others. Let's take a moment about the, about the schools. We have a lot of religious schools here. I suppose there are religious schools elsewhere, too, so we're not you know, unique. But the schools, uh, Chaminade, St. Louis, for example, come to mind. Right. Um, and the schools attached to the churches, otherwise attached, those had a big effect on uh, assimilating people, drawing them into the mainstream, the American mainstream, if you will. Um, what role and uh, why did that happen and why was it so interesting for the, both the, ch the schools and the people who came to the schools? Well, uh, if you go back to, in time, uh, Punahou uh, started out as Oahu College, right, right, and right, there was right. a missionary school. Right. Uh, so the royal family received a very missionary New England uh, education. Yeah. Uh, St. Andrew's Priory was started by Queen Emma, of course, uh, to give an Anglican education uh, uh, of the 1850s. So the, 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 those uh, top schools had uh, a religious component, uh, but they kind of. But if you mention Punahou, you don't think of a Christian education. No. No, but today, in those days, but it's very secular today. In those days, am I right to say this? In those days, schools and religion were wedded. That's correct. You yes. know, the education yeah. was all really a part of, of the church, of many churches. Uh, and in fact, secular schools as we know them today were not nearly as popular. Uh, that's uh, uh, very true, um, and uh, you could see that even Harvard started as a divinity school yeah, <laughs> in the yeah, late yeah, uh, yeah. 17th century, uh, and, and, and Columbia was a king's college under, under uh, so forth. Uh, you're exactly right, and, uh, but at that same time in the mid-19th uh, century, there would be schools like Bates and so forth that would be much more liberal outside of, or Quaker-related, uh, right. that, that would be uh, separating education, and MIT started up in the uh, after the Civil War uh, remember it's purely focused on technology yeah. again so yeah. at that time religion was uh, branching out but it did have a start in Hawaii based on religion well it had a big effect in Hawaii I think and it still does today uh, although it's, um, it's it's vestigial in many ways the religious aspect is vestigial but let's talk about mm, 1941 right. let's talk about the way it was uh, how things were going in the Japanese and Chinese community for that matter uh, but I suppose mostly the Japanese, because that was, that was the involvement. Um, and all of a sudden we have Pearl Harbor, and we have reaction by the United States government, and we have, um, we have a, a, a Japanese community that is vulnerable to that attack on their, their culture, on their religion, their race. Um, what happened? Well, uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, almost all the Buddhist priests, Shinto priests, uh, journalists, others connected to Japanese culture, war, uh, teachers, uh, language teachers, 
were all taken away. And they were interned first in Hono Uli Uli and, take, and, and then to the mainland. They were because they were thought leaders. They, right, exactly. They, 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 they were the community government leaders. was concerned exactly. about that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they were community leaders. They were uh, leading the uh, Nisei or uh, uh, Japanese American population to support the Japanese imperialist cause. And uh, all these temples and, and uh, shrines were closed for the duration of the war. Yeah. I mean, you had to, if you were Buddhist or Shinto uh, practitioner, you had to perform at, at, at home. Uh, you, it was like a uh, secret religion. It was so, against the law. Oh, yeah. I mean, remember, even in the plantation of where my grandmother was in, in Kahului, uh, you couldn't speak Japanese. So you spoke Japanese only in, in your home. You couldn't even listen to Japanese uh, broadcasts. They were all banned, of course. But uh, during that time, and after the war, it was slow to come back. Uh, the temples of uh, course reopened, Shinto shrines. Uh, uh, there was one Izumo Taisha that took until 1961 to return to uh, the uh, to re uh, religious order. Uh, it was held by the city and council. That's a long time. What, can right. you, is there a reason for holding it that long? Well, again, there were uh, uh, Shinto shrines in particular were seen as uh, agents of uh, the Japanese Even government. Even in 1961? Well, yeah, yeah, uh, for a long time. Uh, and so um, it, there was a Shinto priest, uh, priest on Maui who couldn't have a job. He was a bartender at the, at the uh, uh, Wailuku Grand Hotel for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course, uh, the, one, the only one uh, shrine on Kauai was shut down, never reopened. So the Buddhist temples, though, though did reopen and began to uh, deal a lot with funerals. And then they reopened their schools. The Shinto shrines never had real schools attached to their shrines. Ah, okay, yeah. so you, there are Buddhist uh, K to twelve or K to eight or K to six uh, uh, academies, the Hongpa Hong Nanji and others, and yeah. that's where they got the parents to come back and be. And, and of course, there was a, a relationship to uh, funerals. Uh, you had to put your uh, ashes of your parents or grandparents, yeah. and and they would take care of your ashes, like my grandparents' ashes at the. At the uh, Wailuku Honganji on Maui. Uh, I've been there for ages. So th that, and then so they began to uh, come back in the mainstream in the 60s and 70s. And so they were no longer seen as as uh, enemy uh, religion. Yeah, but in the meantime, they probably the Japanese community probably lost a lot of people it went from into, uh, sharp Buddhism decline. to yeah. to Christianity yeah. because they yes. had nowhere to go. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Let's say we have a way to go. We, okay. we, we can take a break. That's, that's the, the freedom here at Think Tech. We should take a break here, you know, around halfway through. Okay. That's uh, Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen. We're talking today about religion in Hawaii, uh, life after statehood. This is so interesting. We'll be right back. You'll see. Okay, so I'm Crystal. If you haven't tuned into Quok Talk before, you better do it because you're missing out on all the information. We talk about sex, we talk about religion, we talk about everything and nothing. So we've got two gentlemen here going to validate that, right? Greg Kinkley and Roy Chu. What's your take on the importance of talking about these issues? It's very important. It's through, I think, expressing ideas and exchanging ideas that we come to a better understanding of the world and each other. And without that, we live in ignorance and fear. And yep. Fear is based on ignorance. Amen. Mm -hmm. Great. Amen. I, what more <laughs> could I say than that? That's Something in Yiddish. I think. Cheers, <laughs> 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 Oi, vai. Hey. Come, listen to Quack Talk Tuesday mornings. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every other Tuesday from 4 p.m. to 4.30 when we discuss the impact of change on employees, employers, and the economy. Okay, we're back. We're live with Ray Tsushima, informed citizen here on uh, Life After State, and talking about religion in Hawaii. It's such an important topic, and a topic that, that, that streams right through all of our society here. So while all this is happening in the late 19th century, 20th century, religion in the world is changing. Its relationship to politics, that's changing. Its relation to social development, well, the, the move of history, it's changing. Uh, and the Establishment Clause, at least in the U.S. Constitution, is having a significant effect. Okay, but somewhere along the line, Hawaii gets kind of synced up to that. And we follow the same trends, maybe around the time of statehood or after statehood. Now, all of a sudden, there are evangel evangel right. evangel evangelical organizations uh, that use technology to reach a lot of people. 
Um, there are born-again Christians everywhere. Um, those things happened in Hawaii too, didn't they? And they had an effect here, didn't they? That's right. Uh, even the traditional church, uh, going back to Vatican II, I mean, uh, throughout the 60s, were great changes and uh, switched from Latin to vernacular languages. Uh, there were all kinds of issues dealing with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, become modern uh, uh, over the traditional. And, of course, the uh, spread of uh, new religions. Um, it's, it's also interesting to point out it's not only Christian <clears throat> evangelical churches like New Hope and others that really uh, appeal to younger people. That They have a lot of uh, you know, new forms of music uh, <clears throat> in their um, uh, uh, rituals and, and, and uh, presentations. Uh, I can think of uh, Seicho no Ie and also... Um, uh, Tendikyo, two uh, post-war Japanese religions that came to uh, Hawaii also. Brand new. Uh, yeah, brand new, and one of them uh, sponsors the Latin, Latin Festival on Memorial Day off of Waikiki. Mm -hmm. Huge deal. Oh, again. big deal. Very, very, very popular. Very big. People really believe right. in that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so these are uh, new religions coming to Hawaii, and also uh, there's been um, uh, trying to deal with... Um, uh, churches as uh, as more involved in politics, as you know, during the Vietnam War, we just <laughs> talked about the Church of uh, the Crossroads being a sanctuary and uh, various Quaker Unitarian churches taking a lead in anti-war kind of demonstration. So you can, and, and of course, uh, civil rights of that time. So, you, and, and also uh, Kauai Hawa Church and others uh, really uh, have been uh, affected and buffeted by uh, changes and awareness and Native Hawaiian rights also. Uh, they're, they're also trying to deal with what is the role of Christianity in the church in the Hawaii, uh, Native Hawaiian host culture. Yeah, so, again, the platform for political action. And, and then, you know, I can't help but uh, thinking of George Bush and his, uh, uh, that is W, uh, in his first um, inaugural uh, at the time he was sworn in, he made a, he made a statement. He says, "I'm I'm going to support faith-based organizations," and and he did. He changed the uh, function of the attorney general around, and he supported. And and of course, the establishment clause was under attack through the through the entire time he was in office, and still is, by the way. Um, and so you know you have this blending of political and religion, and I I suggest that it happened in Hawaii too. Uh, all of a sudden, the Establishment Clause um, was not as, as much a barrier between the two, and churches were taking active positions on, on political issues. No? Well, um, that, that's a trend, but again, I would argue that we live in a society where uh, the, one of the U.S. senators is Jewish, <laughs> there's a congresswoman <laughs> who's uh, a Hindu, uh, two Japanese-American women who, one is, uh, they're both Buddhists. I mean, uh, Colleen Hanabusa is very active in the Honganji and dances very well on the Boondori, uh, which is, again, a, a, a good political base to draw from. Uh, and, of course, uh, Linda Lingo, she was a two-term governor, also Jewish, uh, where the Jewish population of Hawaii is very tiny. It's like a sliver. Yeah. But those religious aspects of their backgrounds were never a factor in their, uh, whether you voted for or against. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, it was other parts of their background that you voted for or against. Yeah. Uh, and, and so... Um, she didn't vote on the basis of religion. No, Not, no. Most people didn't no, vote on the basis no, no, of religion. Uh, very, very, very few. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, although Hawaii is predominantly a Christian um, state with very strong Catholic uh, uh, my, uh, base also because there's uh, uh, a strong Filipino community too. And, but there are... And, and the Portuguese. The Portuguese, the very, very strong big, Catholic, uh, yeah. Catholic. And Irish. And, and John A. Burns was a devout Catholic. Yeah. And I, as I mentioned before our interview, uh, he signed off on, on a very progressive abortion bill of the early 70s. Yeah, well, I think that's so. iconic. Let's talk about that for a minute. Here's, here's a devout Catholic, but a good man and a good Catholic. Um, and, and, you know, part of a, of a robust Catholic community here. And here's a bill that is anti-Catholic right. or a Catholic, you know, cannot tolerate that. And yet he signs off. Why? Well, at that time, he looked at Hawaii society, and um, it was a society that really backed the bill. It was, it was not, it was, he didn't want to use religion as a factor in, in being pro or con. He was looking at the uh, secular base of, of the population and kind of really gauging where the, it was going. And he uh, chose, a, chose a stance that um, was very progressive. 
and, and yet he uh, stuck his uh, neck out and said that this is something that is of the time, that we're yeah, living right. in a it's different time. time. It, it is a different time in, in the history of Hawaii, yeah. and we have to go forward. And Hawaii has never looked back since yeah, then. Yeah, and, and it made a statement. I mean, for example, today, you know the church would oppose death with dignity. It, it does oppose. It has opposed death with dignity for 20 years, but you don't see it in so many words. It may be, you know, at a, at a quiet level, that opposition. And so, I, I'm not, although the churches may take positions on political issues, I, I don't think the system allows for them to take vociferous, high-profile positions on those issues. Uh, maybe this was slightly different in the, in the gay marriage issue, but at least for death with dignity, they haven't been all that obvious about it. And I guess what this means is that, is that Hawaii downplays religious positions, um, that it's okay, uh, that everybody can have his own, uh, and uh, no one religion is trying to control the whole field, uh, that we're tolerant, and they are. I think Hawaii uh, is, it could be a model for the world. Yeah. And, and we have to kind of look at uh, ourselves, and we really don't think about it because uh, so many other communities are racked by, by religious divisions and, and, and uh, how you vote is on a, on a religious or caste base in, in other countries. Uh, and, and this is a very unusual society when you think about it. It very is. Very unusual. And this is just one example of that unusualness, you know. This is part of a whole group of unusual things <laughs> right. that make Hawaii right. special, you know, the, the diversity. But let me ask you, where, where are we going with all this, Ray? Um, what's going to happen in the future? The, the, the children who stay here, hopefully a lot will stay here. Uh, the institutions that get built. The, the churches as they exist and as they will evolve as time goes on. Um, what will happen? Are we going to be more interested or less interested? Are they going to be more active, you know, in helping us on helping the community on social issues, on the homeless, uh, on raising money to help those less advantaged? Um, where are they going and are they as important today uh, as before? Will they be more important tomorrow? Well, for some uh, Catholic and Christian uh, organizations, uh, we mentioned one, uh, IHS, Institute of Human Services, that was started by a Catholic uh, priest in the 70s, yeah. Claude Dutheil. And uh, that was a revolutionary moment, I thought, uh, that took uh, homelessness as a, a really a, a cause, uh, and, and that showed great leadership. Uh, and he, he didn't really, he had, he had a wonderful uh, uh, aloha shirt looking collar with a collar and he was out of the community a lot. So I hope to see more of that in the future. Uh, the activist priests, as they say, uh, they have them in, in Africa and the South, uh, South America really dealing with medical issues, homeless issues, family issues, children issues, education issues, health issues. These are still issues in Waianae and Kahuku, uh, you know, uh, Nanakuli, Kalihi. There's a lot of issues out there uh, and the neighbor islands of, of drug and, and uh, crystal meth. And of course, our huge prison uh, uh, population that we export prisoners to the mainland. These are all uh, issues that deal, uh, that uh, has to do with counseling and getting people to the right, to do the right thing and, and getting people, you know, uh, kind of moving to the right direction. Yeah, and it comes and goes, it's sign curves, you know, and if you look down the trail of history, sometimes they're more effective and sometimes it's less. But let me offer you this one thought in closing, was that you have these problems, social problems around us, very difficult problems, uh, the government is one possibility for solving those problems, and the faith-based organizations are another, um, you know, group of organizations that could solve these problems. And uh, we take a look at one side, we take a look at the other side, we make a decision, maybe without even thinking about it, that one side may be more competent in solving those problems than the other. And if you, if you look at it that way, I would say in the last few years, see if you agree, that the faith-based organizations, the churches such as they are, they're different certainly on a religious level than they were, but they are more competent in solving these social problems than the government, which appears to be less competent. What do you think? They're more, more neighborhood based, the faith based organizations. Okay. I think that's one key advantage that they have. Yes. The other one is that uh, they can take a longer term uh, um, look at the uh, problems and they can put in people who uh, are volunteers or, or, um, uh, or paid staff that are there for a longer period. I mean, in politics and government, you're there for short periods and you try to two solve years this. Cycle yeah, you you try to solve something in point. two or three years, it doesn't work. These are uh, sometimes when we say intractable problems, it's maybe problems of 
for 20, 30 years, but it could be solved. Uh, the other thing that uh, faith-based uh, organizations do better on is disaster preparation and, and also in relief, that they can come in uh, very quickly and really, uh, really help out with, with uh, neighborhoods and so forth. So I think uh, you're correct, that, uh, the, but the thing that faith-based organizations need is money. They need a lot more resources because they can't do larger things. They're very tiny uh, at this point and uh, dealing with you know, neighborhood issues. Uh, uh, what if they could uh, do statewide issues? That's a very interesting yeah. uh, proposition. We have to recognize that confidence, you know? And I think, that I think uh, last, last point for you to consider, I think that going forward, um, the government has to support them and we have to support them because they are a significant feature in dealing with some of the social problems we have and will have um, and so there's a need for them maybe as never before <laughs> there's a need for them <laughs> right, right. in our social right. structure right. yeah right we've never really uh, yeah uh, saw I think we never took the time to really strategize. That's what you, I think you're trying to say, yeah. how they can play an important role in the future of our state. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Great to talk with you, always. OK, thank you. Informed citizen <laughs> Ray Tsuchiyama here on Life After State. We're talking about religion in Hawaii. Thanks so much.